Take a look at this, boss. A cable from our London office. They've just banned Lulu in London. Pretty good, eh? What's good about it? We could have sold 100,000 copies in London. All right, so we'll sell a half a million more copies. Isn't it funny? Every time they ban that book anywhere, sales go zoom in every place else. <laughs> but there's only one trouble. As soon as that London story broke, every seat in town called up wanting an interview with Lulu. That's bad. Don't worry about it, boss. I gave him the usual story. I told him Miss Winters is in seclusion and wishes to remain that way. And how long do you think you can continue with that stall? That I do not know. In fact, this morning, Mr. Dolan from the Chronicle cracked. When are you going to unveil that dame to the public? I was afraid of that. If we only knew where she is. Or even who she is. Yeah? Who? Certainly I'll speak to her. It's long distance. Lula Winter's calling. Talk of the devil. Yes, this is George Dixon. Miss Winters, what a delightful surprise. Is it really her? Uh, yes, it's still selling strong. Oh, Miss Winters, your royalty checks are waiting for you. Over $80,000. Find out something about her. Uh, well, Miss Winters, really, I don't know. She wants to know if we can mail her checks. Nothing doing. Give me the phone. I'll speak to this dame. <coughs> Hello, Miss Winters. This is Jerry Marlowe. I'm the advertising manager of the company. About sending you your royalty checks, I'm afraid we can't do that. No, there's a lot of papers to be signed here. And besides, I suggest that you come here in person. Oh, don't worry about a thing, Miss Winters. You won't have to see a soul. Now, nah, your visit to New York will be our own little secret. Yours, Mr. Dixon's, and mine. You have my promise, no publicity. When will we expect you? Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, one thing more, uh, your identification. You see, Miss Winters, we've got to make sure that you are Lulu Winters. Tell me, do you have a carbon copy of your manuscript? That's wonderful. Bring that along and we'll compare it to the one that we received. Fine, Miss Winters. Thank you, Miss Winters. Goodbye, Miss Winters. <laughs> it's in the bag, boss. In three or four days, the losing Lulu will be sitting right in this office. I'll give that baby a reception and make Eisenhower's welcome look like a cold shoulder. <laughs> Lulu Winters, wherever you are, stand by for action. Note how I developed a reduction formula for the multiple quadratic equations. Now, since we know that for all functions of z inside the circle or convergence of a power series, the function represented by the series has a derivative whose value is given the series obtained by the termwise differential. The solution to our problem is very simple. Any questions? Yes, Willoughby? Um, Professor Featherstone, suppose we examine the legs of a triangle. Mr. Willoughby, your language. I'm, I'm sorry, Professor. Um, suppose we examine the limbs of a triangle, and we find that the ratio of the included angle to the angle opposite... Oh, I'm sorry, Willoughby. There's a faculty meeting at the Dean's house. I'm afraid your question will have to wait until I return from New York. P Professor Featherstone. Yes, Willoughby? Speaking for the entire class, We've heard about your forthcoming lecture before the International Congress of Scientists on the Featherstone Theory of Molecular Agglutination. And, well, we just want you to know that we're all behind you. And we're sure that you'll, well, knock up for an elliptical arc. Thank you, Willoughby. Student? Before the arrival of Professor Featherstone, there's a very serious matter I'd like to discuss. You refer, of course, to that book, Always Lulu. Another student was brought before me this afternoon for reading the book in biology class. I wasn't going to mention it, Dean Fowler, but last night I found a copy hidden in the greenhouse under a potted rhododendron. I found one, too, just after football practice, in my left tackle's headgear. We've banned the book. Now, in my opinion, I think that we should expel all guilty students. Not my left tackle. With our finances, we can't afford to expel any students. There must be some other solution. Good afternoon, Professor Featherstone. Sorry, I'm late. The students gathered around to wish me luck. Oh, how nice. We were just condemning that shocking book. Shocking and disgusting. It's undermining the morals of our young people. Don't you agree, Mrs. Fowler? Why, yes, it's utterly shocking. Something must be done to keep it off the campus. Something will be done, but we'll discuss that some other time. Now for the business at hand. As you all know, in spite of our efforts, enrollment at Croydon has steadily decreased 
Until today, we are faced with a serious financial crisis. However, I feel certain we'll weather the storm, as we've weathered so many others. For now, in this hour of need, we have a pair of young but exceedingly capable shoulders on which to lean. Members of the faculty, our brilliant colleague, Professor Featherstone. Thank you, Dean Fowler, Mrs. Fowler, members of the faculty, for having such great confidence in me. I only hope that all those renowned scientists will share your enthusiasm and listen to an unknown like myself. Unknown? Well, I'm sure that everyone there must have read your paper on cosmic rays and interstellar space. Written when you were a mere child of eight. America's first quiz kid. Your tickets, Jane. And good luck from all of us. Thank you. If, as you all so firmly believe, my lecture at the Congress will enhance the prestige of Croydon and thus help to increase its enrollment, rest assured I shall do my very best. Good luck, Professor. We can count on you, Very good. Jane! Jane, I do wish you'd stay a while. Well, I'd love to, but there's so many last-minute things packing in such a... Oh, but I must see you. Really, it's terribly important. Well, of course, Phyllis. Oh, you're a dear. I'll just make sure they've all gone. I daren't be overheard. There's no one else I can turn to. You're the only real friend I have at Croydon. Oh, Jane, I'm in terrible trouble. Now, now, suppose you tell me all about it. You'll never breathe a word. Well, then, I'm Lulu Winters. Is that all? <laughs> I thought your name was... Lulu Winters? Shh, my husband, he'll hear you. But I don't understand. That notorious book, you. But it was just a hobby of mine. The writing, I mean. There's not a word of truth in it. Besides, I had no idea it would become a bestseller. Now, I don't know what to do. You'd better explain to your husband. Oh, I couldn't. He'd never believe me. And if the faculty found out, the dean's wife, Lulu Winters, it would ruin him, ruin Croydon. Well, now, Phyllis, we all make mistakes in our lives. You've made yours. The only thing for you to do is forget you ever wrote that piece of trash. Yes, I'd like to forget it. But there's a matter of $80,000. $80,000? Yes. Royalties on the book. But they won't release the checks until Lulu Winters appears in person. That's why I've asked your help. My help? Yes. They have no idea what Lulu Winters looks like, and as long as you're going to be in New York... Me? Lulu Winters? Shh! I have me? Uh, Lulu Winters? Oh, I wouldn't dare. What would people think? What would I think? No one will know. I have the publisher's promise. Oh, it'll only take five minutes. Sorry, Phyllis, it's out of the question. Jane, you've got to. I don't want the money for myself. But $80,000. Think what it would mean to Croydon. Croydon? Croydon. Hmm. Croydon? up-to-date magazines and periodicals. And that book of the month, always Lulu. Over a million copies sold already and they're working on the next bit. Get them while they're hot. Only three copies left for three lucky people. I'll take one, son. Thank you, sir. How about you, miss? Gosh. Gosh. talking to myself. But this is the most interesting book I've ever read. Kind of deep for most people, but I need it in my work. Engineer? Bridges. How oh, very interesting. You build bridges? Well, I haven't built any so far. But I intend to someday. Do you like bridges? Well, I hadn't thought about it. I suppose I do. Look. My, that's lovely. Beautiful. What a spot for a bridge. And that low spot on the left bank to the high point on the other side. 
That would be nice. Yeah. She'll be hard to figure, though. You see, there's, there's length, direction, height, angle of elevation. That's difficult. By the law of tangents, we know that the difference of two sides of a triangle is to the sum is the tangent of half the difference of the opposite angles is to the tangent of half the sum. Now, we know the height of the bank side A and the breadth of the river side B, which enables us to determine the included angle, can't delay opposite side A. We have merely to find side C, which is the length of the bridge. We do this by the law of cosines, which gives us the side of a triangle in terms of the other two sides and the angle included between them. This we do by applying the formula, the square of any side of a triangle is equal to the sum of the square of the sum of the other two sides, diminished by twice their product into the cosines of the included angle. Any questions? I mean, that's all there is to it. I never thought. Something wrong with my calculations? Gosh, no, it's just, I never met anyone like you before. You're swell. Thank you. I'm glad you think so. First trip to New York? First time. Me too. Gosh. You've never been to New York. I've never been to New York. We meet on the same train. Gosh. It's a small world. Gosh. Uh, yes, it certainly is. I've never been out of the state of Texas. I've never been out of Indiana. Ever heard of Great Falls? Don't think so. That's where I'm from. Next stop, Grand Central. Well, here we are, the big city. I've always wanted to see that New York skyline. Guess we'll have to wait. meeting you. Yeah, time sure flew by. Well. Look. Yes? I was thinking, you don't know anybody in town, and I don't know anybody in town, and I'd sure like to see you again. How about having dinner with me tonight? Oh, I'd like that. You would? Well, I can phone you at your hotel and we can arrange it. Well, I'm afraid I don't know where I'll be stopping. I could phone you. I don't know where I'll be either. Do you know any place where we could meet? Well, I've heard of places, but I'm not sure I could find them. Say, how about right here at 5.30, right under this sign? 45th and Madison, fine. Taxi! Say, are you sure you'll know me? I mean, there's so many people in New York. Of course. Mm -hmm. well, I'm not taking any chances. Here, you keep this. I took that in one of those machines at the railroad depot. I'll be looking for someone who looks exactly like this. Hey, what's your name? Gosh. Now, boys, we'll take a ride up Fifth Avenue as far as the park, Savoy. Keep them sirens screaming and make a lot of noise with your motors, you understand? That's what we want. Noise, excitement, attention. We got the one and only Lulu Winters here. We don't want to keep it a secret. You hear? The two of the luckiest coppers on the force. Personal escorts for the luscious Lulu. Boy, I wish he'd get here. I read the book. I want to get a load of this dish. My boy, you're going to see a dream walk, and the kind you dream about but you never get. She's going to come in here just dripping with sables and loaded with diamonds. Now, get on your wheels there and get all set, because you're going to be here any minute. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Pretty big day for you, Mr. Marlowe. Oh, you said it, son, you said it. She didn't get here yet, did she? Any minute, son, any minute. Third floor. Hi, a fancy place. Tell me, is the Lord and Master in? Yes, and getting impatient. You might try sending flowers instead of taking them. I'd like to see Mr. Dixon. 
Well, he's pretty busy. Perhaps I can help. No, it's rather personal. I'll wait. It may be some time, miss. Perhaps I'd better try again tomorrow. If you'll just leave your name. Winters. Lulu Winters. Lulu... Lulu Winters? Just a minute. She's here. Miss Winters. Mr. Dixon will see you, Miss Winters. Winters? Yes. Miss Lulu Winters? Yes. The Lulu Winters who wrote the book? Yes. Is there something wrong? Uh, you didn't bring your identification. You mean the carbon copy of the manuscript? Yes, I have it right here. Would you mind waiting outside? We'll be with you just a moment, Miss Winters. Hey, boss, it can't be. It is. This is the manuscript, all right, and that's Lulu. I've got a room full of newspaper men over in the hotel suite waiting for her. If I bring in that air, Dale, I'm sunk. I can't understand it. She doesn't look like a woman who has lived dangerously. I got it, boss. I bet she's traveling incognito. She says she didn't want any publicity, didn't she? Ha! Leave it to me. First, I gotta get rid of the newspaper men. Honey, get me the parcel, boy. As long as you're here, Miss Winters, will you help me with a few details? Do you wish God didn't use the for your corsage? Versailles? For the dinner tonight. Dinner? The Publishers Association. It's in your honor. Dinner in my honor? Right after cocktails at the Algonquin Club. Cocktails? The Algonquin Club? When you finish with the autographs. Aut aut autographs? Just for an hour. You're signing copies of your book at the Crandall Bookstore. That's after you meet with the press. Press? Every paper in town, front page and Sunday Road of Gavure. A couple of newsreel Cameron, too. Why, you'll have enough pictures taken to make you America's number one pinup girl. Pinup? But your 10 day program really begins tomorrow. Luncheon with the mayor at 12, a few words at the library dedication at 2, a lecture on Don't Let This Happen to You at the Women's Club at 3, and then. <laughs> Mr. Dixon, she ran out on me. Winters? Uh-oh, she ain't much, but she's the only who we got. Hey, Miss Winters! Miss Winters! Oh, Miss Winters! Miss Winters! Stop on it, boys. We gotta catch it. Driver, please hurry. Okay, lady. Driver, they're after me. Oh, on the lamb, huh? Well, you ain't gonna get me jammed up with the law. Listen, pal, I'm the innocent victim of circumstances. Why? What's happened? Say something. Speak to me. Hmm. What? Oh my head. Oh, uh, driver, to the parts of boy right away. Will you step on it? Your head hurt? What's the verdict, Doc? The blow on her head has brought on a state of mental repression. There's a complete loss of memory. You mean her mind's a blank? She recalls absolutely nothing up to the moment of the accident. Spellbound. Not an unusual case at all. These conditions generally adjust themselves in time. Well, but how long would you say that? Well, maybe a day, a year, maybe ten. There's no way of knowing. Well, tell me, is there anything I can do for her? Well, you might try to refresh her memory. A friendly name, an incident from her past might snap her out of it like that. Well, Doc, for uh, uh, business reasons, I wouldn't want any word of Miss Winter's condition to leak out. <laughs> well, don't worry. A doctor never discusses his patient's condition without permission. Gee, thank you, Doc. 
Just you send your bill to the office. Good day. Hello? Do I know you? I'm the fellow that brought you here in the taxi. I know, but who are you? I'm Jerry Marlowe. I'm the advertising manager for Dixon and Company. Who are they? They're the publishers. They published your book. Did I write a book? Did you write a book? One of the best seller for the last six months. Always Lulu, the story of your life. Lulu. Lulu Winters. The doctor said that's my name. Is it? That's right. Tell me, don't, don't you remember? You came in here. Where did you come from? I don't remember. Well, where did you go? Did you check into a hotel? I don't know. You know where you left your luggage? Your purse, th there must be some papers or a hotel key in the... No, you didn't have a purse when I... Do you remember where you left your clothes? My clothes? Why, sure, that's what you're wearing. That's a gag. You were traveling incognito, weren't you? Why would I do that? Well, I don't know. Maybe you were trying to hide from a jealous wife or a disappointed lover. Did I have a disappointed lover? Why was he disappointed? You had more disappointed lovers than Cleopatra. Oh, the suit. I bet there's a store label in it. Should be one of... No. Wait a minute. Who's this? I don't know. Well, try to remember. I can't. Oh, this is terrible. I'm frightened. I don't know who I am or how I got here. A picture of a man I can't identify. No purse, no money. Oh, well, don't worry about the money, because you've got $80,000 in our office. 80000 yeah, the royalties from your book. The book. Why did I think of it before? I'll read it to you. Maybe we can run across this fellow's name. Give me the bookshop, will you please? Hello, bookshop. Will you send a copy of Always Lulu up to 24A, please? What? You mean got one copy? No, 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 I need it right now. Never mind. Excuse me, sir, but I have a copy I could give you. What a break. Gee, you're a lifesaver, honey. I've already read it three times. Yes, that's all. There you are, dear. Thank you, sir. No, no, thank you. You know, Lulu's story is just like my own. We've both seen life. Yeah, but you've only seen it through a keyhole. Got it. Now tell me if anything sounds familiar. Hey, that brazen woman on the cover. What a horrible creature. That's you. Now, I was but a child the first time I fell in love. An innocent maiden of 15, pausing bewildered on the threshold of life. Mm, an innocent maiden. Little did I know of the perfidious nature of men. And then I met Sir Hubert. He was slightly older than myself, but he was charming. He was sweet and attentive. He was rich and worldly, and he knew well how to turn the head of a young girl with his honeyed words and promises. It was he who gave me my first kiss. Dear Sir Hubert. You remember him? No. I was 18 now, and life in all its grim sordidness had hardened me. I was not easily misled the following night by Ronaldo's protestations of love. I knew perfectly well why he had lured me to Monte Carlo. The cad! I must have been furious. It intrigued me. I was delighted. Before I was aware of it, he had me in his arms, whispering mad words of love in my ear. Madly, we danced round and round. Vainly, I struggled to free myself. His lips caught mine. Closer. 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 Here, you better read this yourself. I did that? Well, well, 
What I want to know is how did I find time to write a book? Here, read more. I want to find out who all gets the girl. A week later, Ronaldo was forgotten completely. I was on a little balcony overlooking the Bay of Naples. Across the table from me, the Hindu prince, Rama Singh, was eyeing me hungrily. In the moonlight, he looked dangerously sinister and mysterious as he slowly sipped champagne from my slipper. Champagne? From my slipper? You drank it all the time. In fact, you used to put away so much champagne, the first time I read this book, I had a three-day hangover. That reminds me. Maybe those reporters overlooked the bottle or two in that icebox. Here. I'll be right back. Rama Singh was just like the others. The moment we were alone, he swept me into his arms and tried to make love to me. He even offered me half his throne, but I spurned him. He became violent, but I knew how to handle men. <laughs> Gently, I ran my fingers up the back of his neck and toyed with his hair. He was like putty in my hands. But alas for the poor prince, unable to live without me, he killed himself. He sent me his ashes in an urn as a memento of his love. He sent me his ashes. What a beautiful sentiment. Here, you finish this yourself. But you will come again soon, dear Mr. Marlowe. Yes, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll be seeing you. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Poor Rama Singh. Handle those ashes carefully. It's an old boyfriend of mine. Must be. Yeah. 
Look, Dixon, you couldn't fix it up for a guy, could you? You know, I've had a yen to take her out ever since I read her book. And you and four million others. Hey, back to your wife and kids. Look, Dixon, I'm not married. Now, how's about fixing it up? Boys, I'll do the best I can for all of you. But after all, there's only one Lulu Winters. One Lulu Winters. Well, maybe right there. The moment you've been waiting for, now brace yourselves. Gentlemen, I give you the toast of five continents, Miss Lulu Winters. Hubba, hubba. Boys, 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 take it easy. Don't rush the little thing. She's very fragile. Look, but don't touch. Ah, ah. Sit down here, my dear. Miss Winter, do you have any plans concerning marriage? Marriage? I'm afraid not. Marriage is so, 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 don't you think? Did you ever see Don Carlos again after you left Tahiti? Don Carlos, Tahiti? Oh, yes, Donnie, a dear boy. Dear, dear boy, Donnie, yes. What finally happened to Count Alexander? Poor Alex. Let us just say he died for love. Uh, Miss Winters, hmm? uh, when do you intend starting your new book? Oh! <laughs> mm. New book? There'll be no new book. There's so much to do and so little time to do it in. Something wrong, no, Mr. Marlow? For a week you've been coming every day, and every day your face has been getting longer. Oh, I got troubles, Joe. Big troubles. Take a tip from me. Never do business with women. Oh, hello, boss. I do the same. Short bourbon high. You don't have to tell me. No luck. That's right. Two weeks coaxing, pleading, arguing, threatening. The woman still refuses to start a new book. She won't listen to me either. She's got 80,000. Why should she bother? That's the trouble. She's got too much money. If she were broke, we'd be a cinch. Say, boss, who does Joe remind you of? Joe? No, he's a dead ringer for Count Boris Potatsky. And who, may I ask, is Count Boris Potatsky? That character in Always Lulu. Count Boris Potatsky, the big true love of Lulu's life. But Joe fits his description to a T, accent and all. Don't you remember? When Count Boris Potatsky walked into my life, all of the men were forgotten. He was a man among men, the one true love of my life. Without hesitation, I laid my fortune and my heart at his feet. So what? So what? Listen, don't you remember? Count Boris used to separate her from her money faster than other boyfriends could supply it. She don't know what the real Count looks like. Why can't we ring in a phony? You mean Joe? Certainly. With a little encouragement, Joe could separate her from her bankroll as fast as Count Boris did. Once the woman's broke, we're all set. You can think of more underhanded schemes. Ah, now, boss. No flattery. Hey, Joe. Come here a minute. How would you like to quit this place and go to work for me? Work? <laughs> That's a word I don't like. Business here is at the minimum, so all day Joe can relax at the maximum. That kind of work I love. Well, you love this kind of work, too. I want you to help a young lady spend about $80,000. Are you interested? Not only am I interested, but you already can consider me employed. That's the kind of man talk I like. Tell me, did you read that book, Always Lulu? Mm-hmm. Twice in English, once in French, twice in Russian. It's best in French. What a book. What a woman. <laughs> you remember a guy in that book called Count Boris? Oh, am I remembering? A very fortunate individual. Except for an incy-weensy twist of the fate, I could have been Count Boris with a beautiful, wealthy sweetheart. And he could have been on this dog mixing martinis. Well, shake hands with fate, Joe. Because from now on, you're Count Boris Patatsky. Ah? Huh? any place. Who are you? The darling, don't you remember? I'm Boris. Boris? Count Boris Ivanovich Patotsky, the only man you really ever loved. Chapter 6 to 8 inclusive, also four pages in chapter 9. But I still don't understand. But, sweetheart, you mean you've forgotten so soon? 
no. No, of course not. Oh, good. Then give him a dollar. Me? Naturally. Didn't you always pay my bills? Naturally. <laughs> How many rooms have we? We? Naturally. Ah, it will be like the good old days in Buenos Aires. I think we'll do the room over. Cerise and Chartreuse. But you can't. It's unthinkable. All right, make it blue and white. Oh, no. I, I mean, you can't stay here. Darling, how can you talk like this to your precious Boris? You're so beautiful, like a little blossom. Oh, now, please. How I've missed you. I've searched for you everywhere. Now, cut that out. And now, at last, we are together, together forever. Mm. Oh, now, stop. That check. Oh, no. Don't you remember Paris in the spring, those glorious mad days in Rio, those wonderful nights in Trafalgar Square? Yes, yeah, I remember, but, but look here, uh, Boris, this isn't real. I, I mean, things are different up here. Okay, as you wish. But I think it's very silly of you to spend money on two apartments when one would do very nicely. Room service, please. What's that for? It will be like the good old days. We'll be together, alone. We shall dine by candlelight. And exactly the same menu as our last night together. Let me see. Page to ten. Oh, yes. Caviar à la Russe, champagne. Borscht Moscovite, champagne. Buffalo Stroganov, champagne. Salade à Levier, champagne. Blinchki à la crème, champagne. Featherstone. That's her picture, as large as life. She was always so, so proper and conservative. <laughs> Throwing money away like that. Well, I remember the time when I had to force her to buy a new hat. Obviously, a dual personality. A female Jekyll and Hyde. Did she say anything about us? No, thank heaven. She kept the name of Croydon out of it. Uh, this explains why she didn't show up to the scientist Congress. Yes, but it doesn't explain a lot of other things. If I may be permitted to say a word. I know I'm not a member of the faculty, but I was always very close to Jane. Perhaps if I went to New York and reasoned with her. Impossible, my dear. I wouldn't have you associate with her. But darling, think what the money she's spending would mean to Croydon. If there's any left. I'm sorry, Phyllis. I must forbid it. Listen to this. Every wolf in New York is howling at her door. Here she is with her latest conquest, Horace Van Cleve. Van Cleve? Well, I know that name. Van Cleef Shipyard's one of the richest men in the country. It says here he's going to name a ship after the Jane Featherstone. No, the Lulu Winters. to the Van Cleef fleet. Long may she sail. Just think, my name sailing the seven seas to distant ports. Lisbon, Singapore, Marseille, Pago Pago. Oh, well, not exactly, my dear. She's the new Albany River boat. 
a fly in the ointment. Van Cleef. Here I go knock myself out trying to find ways for Boris to spend their money, and this guy throws it at us so fast we take more than 20 phony rushes to get rid of it. Uh, don't worry, I'm willing to work overtime, no extra charge. Should never get started on that new book. She ain't gonna do that to my bonus. Watch me put the finger on this little romance right now. Oh, pardon me, Mrs. Van Cleef? Yes? Well, I'm coming to launching for my paper. I'd like to ask you a question. Well? Well, last year, your husband launched a boat called the Daisy Davenport. It was named after a singer in the scandals. And then the Bubbles Belmont, she was a balloon dancer in the Follies. And Claire Laverne, a nightclub cigarette girl. Tell me, how come your name is not one of your husband's boats? My name is on his calling cards. And furthermore, it's going to remain there. I'll be up to see you very soon, Lulu. I have a little present I think you'd like. <laughs> oh, Horace, you have already been more than generous. Oh, it's a mere baggy tale. Some men collect stamps, others breed racing pigeons. Spending money is my hobby. <laughs> oh, goodbye. <laughs> Drive this winter to a hotel? Yes. <laughs> Just a moment, driver. So at first, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, it's, it's me, all right, ma'am. But I don't think we. Gosh, it's you. Is it? But you look so different. I never would have recognized you. I recognized you from your picture. Do you really keep it? Oh yes, I have it right here. I guess I put on a little weight since then. Say, you're the girl who lost the ship. Well, what do you know about that? Gosh, didn't realize you were such an important person. Oh, I'm not really important. You know, I thought about you a lot since our train trip together. Our train trip together? Oh, yes, our train trip together. I really ought to be sore at you. I waited almost two hours the night you stood me up. We had a date? Certainly. Don't you remember? I was going to take you out to dinner. Well, as long as we had a date, we certainly ought to keep it. How about tonight? Do you mean it? Seven o'clock. I'm at the Park Savoy. It's a date. Fine. Well, goodbye. Bye. <laughs> I don't get it, Eddie. How do you know her? We're old friends. I gotta find some good place to take her to dinner. You lucky dog. Wouldn't I like to be in your shoes? I don't blame you. Well, what do you know about that? Again, I forgot to ask her name. Are you kidding? Why, that's Lula Winters, the dame that wrote the book. Book? What is it? Scientific textbook? Well, it all depends on what you're studying. playthings, dangle them on a string like puppets, and when no longer needed, toss them aside forever. Ah, darling. Tonight I have planned the most brilliant evening for us. First you're gonna take us to dinner, then you're gonna take us to the opera, then oh, you're gonna... I'm sorry, Boris, but I've made other plans. Other plans? But how can you treat your little Borichka like that? Huh, still another man in your life, eh? Don't forget, I am the only man you ever really loved. It says so in your book, chapter 6 to 8 inclusive, and also four pages in chapter 9. I know, Boris, but you've just got to go. Perhaps tomorrow night. No, Boris is not leaving. My mind is made up. Please, Boris, I'll do anything. Remember that wristwatch you like so much? 
You mean the platinum one with the emerald numerals? Yes, you can have it if you just leave. Oh, so you think you can break Boris's heart and mend it with a wristwatch? Uh, all right, for your sake, I accept. Oh, thank you, Boris. Uh, my little potato, I forgive you for breaking my heart. <laughs> That's him. What do we do? He may misunderstand your being here. Well, don't get nervous all over in such matters. I'm a master of diplomacy. Bedroom. Thank you. I've been wanting to do that ever since we met. Now I got it out of my system. You shouldn't have done that. I, I don't even know your name. Since when would that make any difference to you? But if you're interested, the name is Caldwell. Eddie Caldwell. Not Baron Eddie or Count Eddie or Sir Eddie, but just plain Eddie. And I haven't got any money or jewels to throw at you. And you needn't worry about that kiss I took. It's the first and last. I don't understand. I read your book, if you can call it a book. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. And I was sap enough to think you were a nice, sweet girl. What a laugh. A nice, but sweet... But that's, that's all in my past. You've got to believe me. From now on, I'm different. Different? Don't worry. You are different. All men are playthings. Dangle them on a string like puppets, then toss them aside forever. Well, here's one fellow who doesn't dangle. And those lies you told me. Poor little me. I've never been out of Great Falls, Indiana in my life. I've never even heard of Great Falls. That's what I thought. More lies. Having a few laughs at the expense of a hick from Texas. Well, I'll take Texas any time. Miss Winters, I detest melodrama, but I just dropped by to give you a little bit of friendly advice. Keep away from my husband. Your... your husband? Which one is he? Wreck so many homes you can't even keep track of. You keep out of this, whoever you are. I'm Mrs. Van Cleve, and if you think you're going oh. to... Horace's wife. Well, I assure you, Mrs. Van Cleve, we're merely friends. Friends? I know what it means when Horace names a ship after somebody. Look, ma'am, you're probably right. Miss Winter seems to have made quite a career out of home wrecking, but that gun isn't going to help matters any. Why, if I kill that, that woman, no jury in the world would convict me. They'd probably give me a medal. I agree with you. Now, see here, Mrs. Van Cleve, I simply won't have you talk that way about me. If I were you, I'd keep my past a secret instead of publishing it for the world to see. Why, you're absolutely shameless. Ma'am, those are my sentiments exactly. And don't you so much as even look at my husband again. That's all I have to say for now, Miss Always Lulu. Hoochie coochie coochie, hoochie coochie coochie, see what daddy's got. Minus. Hi. See what I brought you, my dear. I saw you in the lobby downstairs and wanted to surprise you. It's pretty, isn't it? What are you doing here? Hmm? Eh? Why, Miss Winters. I had no idea. What a happy coincidence. Yes, isn't it? No coincidence, nothing. You came up here to see that woman. Why, Millis? And you brought her this. Now, listen to me, Mrs. Van Cleve. I assure Cleve, you, I... dearest, your suspicions are utterly without foundation. I've said just about without all foundation. foundation. You're up to your old tricks again. Oh. Uh, bursting in here, scaring the whistle. I took care of the others, and I'll take care of this one, too. I have a good mind to notify the manager. Oh! oh you've got good oh, reason oh, to be oh, angry, ma'am. Back home, home you keep out of it. Who are you? Haven't I seen you somewhere before? Oh, I give you my word. I had no idea he was coming. Naturally, you just got your dates oh, mixed up again. Oh, come along with me, Horace. I'm going to take you right straight uh. home this minute. I'll have this back in the morning, cleaned and pressed. Hmm, another man. That doesn't surprise me. Everything I said before goes double. If you'll just listen to Write me. Write it into your next book. Come, Horace, I won't stand another thing I'm of getting it. out of here, too. Hello. <laughs> Honey, I just heard... Hey, what is this? It's beginning to look like a convention. A man behind every door. I'd certainly hate to look under your bed. Take it easy there, son. Who are you? 
The name is Eddie Caldwell. You want to make something out of it? Yeah, I like the way you're talking to Miss Winters, and I won't have it. No? No. <laughs> Look here, Tavares. This is our not liking. Who are you? Peasant, you are addressing His Excellency Count Boris Ivanovich Patotsky, Chapter 6 to 8 inclusive, also four pages in Chapter 9. The only man she ever loved. Yes? Yes. I don't blame a nice, clean fella like Eddie for running out on me. What man with any self-respect would even talk to a woman like me? Could have been so wonderful. Our own little bungalow. Like other people have. And in the evening, Eddie comes home from work. He waves from down the street. He comes rushing up the stairs, two at a time. Hello, darling, we kiss. He sniffs. What is that, he asks. I smile. Corned beef and cabbage, New England style. I torture myself. Things like that are not meant for me. If only I had never met Sir Hubert. The first kiss started everything. Chapter one, page one. He couldn't even wait till page two. The troubles are over, my little dog. I'm offering you the protection of the honorable name of Boris Ivanovich Patos. You mean marriage? You marry me? Why not? But you don't realize what you're saying, Boris. No man is right-minded marry me. For you, I make that sacrifice. Oh, I'll try and live down my past and make you a good wife. Good. Then it's settled. <laughs> After we're married, we'll go to Russia. There, we'll buy us a beautiful home. We shall be very happy. Then, in a year, maybe two... Yes, Boris. We shall buy us a country home also. Oh, it sounds wonderful, but our beautiful home will have to wait. Even our trip to Russia. I'm afraid by the time I pay the hotel and a few other bills, I won't have anything left. You mean you broke, penniless? Not even a measly few thousand you overlooked by mistake? But what's the difference? We'll be together. You'll get a job. Job? Now look here, my little tomato. Maybe you're right. Perhaps we should wait a little while. In a few years, you could get adjusted to being an honest woman. In the meantime, you can write maybe another book. What for? No. Wouldn't be fair to you. My chivalry will not permit it. Better I go out of your life forever. Mmm, Mr. Marlowe. Hi, Boris. Formerly bought. The honeymoon is over. You mean there's no money left? Not a ruble. Good work, Joe. In the future, if there should arise employment of a similar nature, you'll keep me in mind, yes? You will like a boy. Such a heel. Why all the gloom? What's the matter? Nothing. Ah, Dr. Jerry has got the prescription for what ails you? Change your climate. Maybe South America. Warm, carefree days on Carl Sands. Ah, that's the life. But Jerry. Only cost you a couple thousand. That's just it. I can't afford it. I'm practically broke. I can understand you geniuses, what you do with your money. However, a few weeks on a new book and you'll be back in the chips again. Then I'll handle your money for you. No, Jerry, there isn't going to be a new book. Oh, now, honey, don't say things like that. But I sit down at the typewriter and nothing happens. It's just as though I'd never written before. Well, it's that black curtain behind you. As soon as we get it raised, you'll write a dozen new books. First, we've got to find out about Lula winners before the accident. Where you'd been, what you'd been doing, who your friends were. Eddie said he knew me. Met me on a train. There's a clue. Where were you coming from? Well, he mentioned the name of a town. What was it? Now think, this is important. I can't. It's that black curtain. Close your eyes. Big river? Little valley? Yeah, keep trying. Hot springs, great neck. I've got it. Great Falls. Great Falls, Indiana. Well, 
anything around here seem familiar? Not so far. Well, let's check these bags. We'll go to town and look around. Jump and G Hospital. I guess we just about covered this one horse town. Look, it's 1.30. We can just get a train out of here. Hey, don't go by that clock. It hasn't worked in years. Wait a minute. How do you know that? I have no idea. I just seem to know that clock always says 1.30. Come on, let's take a look around in here. No, not this. Not in the middle of winters. Why don't we go on this far, the we <laughs> Oh, excuse me, we would... I didn't think you'd have the nerve to show your face around here again. You mean she's been here before? Very much so. We know all about your duplicity, Professor Featherstone. Pardon me, did you say professor? You're very sly about it, all right. Teaching calculus in the daytime. Writing that demoralizing book at night. I was teaching. And then to betray the school by not showing up for your lecture at the Scientist Congress. That was unforgivable. Just a minute. You mean Miss Winters was giving lectures? Miss Winters? On the Featherstone theory of intermolecular agglutination. Intermolecular what? I never even heard of it. Never even heard of it. Huh. Your own theory. Well, she's telling the truth, lady. Miss Winters has had an accident. She doesn't remember a thing you're telling her. A likely story. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll give the name of the doctor that's taken care of her. He'll bear me out. Even if that's true, and I don't say I believe it, Miss Featherstone is not welcome. Now, just a minute, you... No, Jerry, if I've done what they claim, they're right. We'd better leave. Calculus, they said I used to teach that. Kind of taking the wind out of your sails. Maybe it wasn't such a good idea we came up here. Come on, let's go back to New York. That's a mistake. They've used the wrong reduction formula in the set of multiple equations. The symbol of Y should be over the symbol of capital X. Any questions? something. I spoke about the Moria theorem. If a single valued function of f times z has its integral zero, we met at the dean's house. They gave me the tickets for the train. Phyllis wanted to speak to me. Jerry, I remember. I'm not Lula Winters. I didn't write that book. I would have admitted everything before, but I didn't know about your accident. When Mr. Marlowe told me... Phyllis came to me at once. I was shocked. Naturally. But I believe once I explained to the faculty... Well, you mustn't tell them. Oh, but Jane, I can't let you shoulder the responsibility for something I've done. There's nothing to be gained. They think I'm Lulu Winters, and it's better for Croydon if they continue to think so. It doesn't matter as far as Croydon is concerned. When the school term ends in two weeks, we end with it. You mean the school isn't opening next semester? Not unless a financial miracle occurs. Well, Phyllis could write another book. Jerry Marlowe said that another Lulu Winters novel would bring in a fortune. Oh, I, I couldn't. I'm not really a writer. I just happened to scribble off a few things. And... Wait. Perhaps some good will come of Lulu Winters after all. When I was in New York, I met Horace Van Cleve. He's one of the richest men in America. Do you think he'd help Croydon? I know he will. Spending money is his hobby. I'll call and make arrangements for the first train back to New York. Yes, dear? Just how did you manage to write that book? My dearest, whatever do you mean? The... 
the things in the book, do they really happen? I mean, is it actually an autobiography? Why, whatever put that in your mind? Well, before we met, you had been to South America, Europe, Tahiti, and all those places in the book. Oh, darling. It all came from my imagination. After all, what would all those men see in silly little me? <laughs> Think nothing of it, my dear. Naming a ship after you is nothing at all. You're not just saying that, are you? Of course not. Money means nothing to me. I love to spend money. It's my hobby. <laughs> oh, you excuse me? Hmm? <laughs> uh... Yes. Who? Oh, yes, I'll see her. <coughs> Yes, I'll see that party at once, yes. <clears throat> I'm awfully sorry, my dear, but a very sudden business matter. Yes, I'll see you later. I'll, I'll call you up later, my dear. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Horace. Lulu, what's happened to you? Nothing. I've been away for a couple of days. Horace. You've been a real friend, and, well, I, I'm in a little trouble. I need help. Help? What uh, kind of help? Oh, it's not me. It's Croydon. Who's he? Croydon is a college that's very dear to my heart. They need money, or they'll be forced to close. Hmm, how oh, very depressing. I know how little money means to you. Just a minute, Miss Winters. You said if I ever needed anything. Well, things have been very bad lately. You understand? Bills, taxes, seasonal business slump. But what? Uh, it's getting late. I'm terribly busy. Uh, why don't you call again sometime? Or better still, uh, <coughs> drop me a line. <laughs> I understand. Okay. And after all his big talk and promises, he wouldn't even listen to me. Well, I could have told you that in advance. However, there's right guys and wrong guys. By the way, I was over at the Van Cleve shipyards the other day, on a matter of business, of course, and I happened to meet your old friend, Eddie. You did? Yeah. He said he felt like two cents when I told him about the Featherstone Lulu Winters mix-up. And the poor kid was apologizing all over the place for soccer being in the jaw. He's nice. Yeah, so is that right hook of his. By the way, why don't you go over there and say hello to him? I'd like to, but I have to get back to Croydon. Van Cleve was our last hope. I might as well be there for the closing exercises. Talking about Van Cleve, you know, I was reading the paper the other day where he's given another one of those big receptions at his mansion in Long Island. You know, those shindigs mostly sent him back about 25 grand. Seems as though he has money for everything else. That's the way he operates. Well, I shouldn't burden you with my troubles. Goodbye, Jerry. Yeah, goodbye. Come here. Yeah, sure, certainly. Why not? Listen, Jane, you ain't going back to Great Falls. There's work to be done here. Sit down. Maybe Jane Featherstone couldn't get a dime out of Van Creep, but Lulu Winners can. And dear, between you and Horace, you've managed to gather just about everybody who's anybody. <laughs> Governor Kilgore, Commissioner Forbes, you wouldn't possibly be cooking up a little deal. Could be. Governor? Commissioner? Ladies? Oh, Van Cleve. Quite a party. Thank you, Governor. I wish you'd reconsider and remain for the weekend. I'd love to, but, well, I've got to get back to my desk. Too bad we couldn't look at those blueprints before His Excellency leaves. I think we will. I've had every draftsman and engineer at the plant working overtime. As soon as the prints are completed, they'll be rushed over here. Splendid. That'll give us a chance to run over them. Yes. Jerry. Now, don't worry about a thing. Just, just remember everything I said. But, Jerry, I'm scared. Well, it's not too late to back out. No, I'm going through with it. This is for Croydon. Moratori te salutimus. Millicent, 
I want you to concentrate all your attention on the governor. If everything comes off as expected, there'll be a very handsome present for you. Perhaps a little of your old Napoleon cognac might put you in a receptive mood. My last bottle? All right, crack it out. Mr. and Mrs. Jason Carter. Miss Lulu Winters. Mr. Jerry Marlowe. Well, Miss Winters, what a delightful surprise. What are you doing here? Dear, dear horse, it was so sweet of you to invite me. But I didn't. <laughs> You old rascal, you. You old rascal, you. Well, come on, chum. How's about buying a gal a snort? By all means. How am I doing? You never look better. Keep it up. Hope my knees don't buckle under me. How dare you invite that woman into our house? I didn't invite her. Get rid of her. Uh, yes, my dear. And that goes for her lipstick. Huh? Here, here she is. Oh, there's Governor Kilgore and Commissioner Forbes with their wives. Professor, you're on your own. Mm, here I go. and Poochie Forbes. Sorry I couldn't keep that date the other night, boys. Oh, no, really, darling. I mean, I've never... That is, this young woman is... Did I say something wrong, Cuddle? There's someone most anxious to meet you, Miss Winters. I'm sure you'll excuse her. Hey, my arthritis. Mrs. Kilgore, may I say you look lovely, utterly lovely. Beauty like yours is so rare, so exquisite, so to be envied. Well, thank you very much, Miss Winters. Why did you say she was a mangy old piece of burlap with a face like a barracuda? Why, Horace, dear, I believe you're peeved. Anything wrong? Get out of my house. But, Horace, I'm having such a wonderful time. I just love your party. Oh, a Get out of my house. Well, I'm willing to go, but it will cost you dough about 80 grand and maybe more. 80,000? That's blackmail. Blackmail? Oh, Horace, how can you use that word? After all, the money isn't for me. It's for dear old Croydon College. The Institute is destitute. I'll have no part of it. You'll be sorry. Hiya, Junior. May I come in? I beg your pardon. Mr. Van Cleve, I've never been so humiliated in my life. Please, I'll wrap. We're leaving at once. You must forgive me. I promise you I'll get rid of that woman. We're leaving at once. You can't. The blueprints, they'll be here any minute. You know, my study's upstairs. I, I promise you that I'll get that woman out of here. I promise you. Yes, sir. I got some papers here for Mr. Van Cleve. I'll see that he gets them. Sorry, mister. I got to deliver these personally. Wait here, sir. And I'll say it again. No jury in the world would convict me. Millicent, you can't. Think of the scandal it would create. What do you think she's creating in there? Oh, there must be an easier way. Here are your blueprints. Oh, yes, the blueprints. Thank you. Oh, 
know you. Don't I know you? Oh, Miss Winter's a partner. You're an accomplice of hers. A fellow conspirator working in cahoots to ruin me. Nothing of the sort. You're fired as of right now. Get out of here. That suits me fine. Now listen, Eddie. You again. Why don't you and your girlfriend keep away from me? Haven't you caused me enough trouble already? Now you cost me my job, and I like my job. I know, but I can explain everything. Okay, then explain this. Oh. Now there's just one thing more. I'm gonna do something that should have been done years ago. Page one, chapter one. No! Never enter your house again. My no. friends will hear about it. Oh, I'm going to get rid of this woman. I assure you, I... Ow! 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 I'll be good. Please, I'll be please, good. Miss Winters, I gave up. Enough's enough. Just come with me to the library. Hold on, Mr. Van Cleve. Uh, You'll have to wait your turn. Ow! take a little trip to the coast and Eddie thought he'd come along for the ride. That's as far as Great Falls. Sure is nice here. Gosh. Oh, I'm glad you like it here. Please, Professor. We... You better hurry. You're late for class. Oh, yes, my class. Goodbye, Professor. Goodbye, Jerry. Jane. Yeah. Uh... I'll see you after school. Good afternoon, students. I trust you all took care of your homework. Kindly open your textbooks to page 85. Any questions? 